Now we finally got... Well, you all came to find out what God's first name was. I know, right? Uh, well, it may be a surprise. It may not be a surprise. You can turn that on if you like. Yeah, go ahead. First, I want to talk about alliances. What you ally yourself with. What you become connected to. What is the important connection in your life? You know, good alliance can be a very good thing, right? And then, even politically, the countries have had some strange alliances over our history. In the Bible, in the book of Jeremiah, you know Jeremiah, right? You remember Charlie Farkason from Hee Haw? And Charlie Farkason's Bible, he called it the book of Jerry Meyer. And he paraphrased Jerry Meyer saying, you're doing it all wrong. It was kind of what Jeremiah kind of boils down to. But I'd like to share with you the, the words from uh, 17th chapter, beginning in verse 5. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his arm. I need to speak about that. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the person who trusts in man, human, human thinking, those human ideas we've been teaching each other for generations about how to get through life. What are some of the truths about life? And folks, we've had some pretty goofy ideas about life, don't you think? About how to get ahead in life. About how to get your good in life. So trusting from that aspect. Man who trusts in man and makes flesh his arm. Takes in the things of the outside world. The appearances. The material things and thinks of those as one's strength, or one's strength in physicality. Well, if it's not going to happen naturally, I'll make it happen. We can do that, can we not? Or we can try. He's like a shrub uh, well, whose heart turns away from the Lord. In other words, looking to the world and the things of the world instead of to the Creator and to the truth of being. He's like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an in uninhabited salt land. That's the result of looking at the world and deciding what life is all about from the message of the world. It's who you know. It's your connections. It's getting your good at somebody's expense. There's only so much good out there, you know. So you have to get what you can get while the getting is good or the good is, you know what I mean. <laughs> That's looking to man, not to God. But then he, he parallels that with the next passage in verse 7. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord, whose trust is in spiritual principle, whose trust is in the Creator and the principles that Jesus taught, the things He said. And He said, you know, do them. Be not just hear, don't listen to, to me, or just read the words in the Bible. You need to put them into practice in your life. When you do, then the next verse, he is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes. Something planted near water, that's a perfect place to be, isn't it? No matter what comes, drought comes, you've still got your water supply. You're connected to the source, looking to the truth of your being, looking to the creator and the Spirit of God within you, you stay connected to the source that brings your good to you. For its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. 
That's a, that's a very nice passage. And it reminds us where our heads need to be. So, you need an alliance, but with what? What is your creator? What is God to you? I can remember, Ted, well, you remember Ted Dressy? Mm -hmm. Ted, when he first came to Unity, and it wasn't here, it was some years before he came here. He told me once, he said he, he thought when he had first went to Unity that they had taken away his God. Well, God out there on a cloud somewhere, a being that acts and behaves like a human being, something that is anthropomorphic, created like us. And at first, he thought, I'm losing my God because God as principle is a whole different thing to look at, a whole different mindset. And to see creation and the creator in a whole different light. Emma Curtis Hopkins reminds us, and here's a quotation of hers, I am seeking my good, and my good is my God. You remember that part? I am seeking my good, and my good is my God, because it draws and pushes me. The Spirit of God draws you to greater good. When you're seeking your good, and you realize that your good is God, you make a connection to the source and then receive the things. Jesus put that a different way. He said, seek ye first the kingdom. And all this stuff follows. Seek a consciousness of the creator with you, not separate from you, not separate and on another cloud or in another dimension, but right here, right where you are. Hopkins suggests that dissatisfaction, when we are dissatisfied, that we're dissatisfied because we're not experiencing our good, then it is because we are resisting our good. We are resisting God. And the opposite, satisfaction comes from accepting that God power in our lives. Whatever we pursue, whatever we seek, you are a part of God, and the good is God as well. So you're seeking one and the same thing. My God is my good. Many paths lead to God. Many paths lead to good. And that's because God and good are omnipotent, all power and omnipresent. Where can you go to get away from it? Nowhere. Everywhere throughout the universe. They are magnetic and dynamic. They draw us and they push us. Certainly a connection to that creator within yourself. A, an awareness of God with you as opposed to God separate from you is dynamic. It causes you to move and experience life in ways you would never do if you thought you were separate from God. I have another quote from Emma Curtis Hopkins, and this gives you your answer. The first name of God is good. First name of God is good. And the first name of good is God. We say the nature of God is absolute good. If its nature is absolute good, is it not good? Everything you seek in life, all the good you seek, love, peace, happiness, satisfaction, is that not God? Is that not Godness? God's first name? Good. Good's first name? God. What's it like to be on first name basis? Doesn't that... It, doesn't that automatically indicates some kind of intimate relationship, a connection. Uh, first name seems to indicate some kind of importance, doesn't it? First. 
It comes before the other. First name of God is good. First name of good is God. First name of God is good. That's a spiritual connection. The first name of God is good. That's God implanted itself within ourselves. Now Hopkins says, and here's another quote of hers, there is good for me and I ought to have it. There is good for me and I ought to have it. Why? You're God's child. You're, you're created by an infinite creator that supplies every need. What do you have to do to get your good? Well, you already deserve it. You have to be open and receptive and responsive to it. You're not here to learn how much you can do without. And how many of us have had periods in our lives where we, well, I can do without that. I don't really need that. You're here to experience how much you can accept, not do without. So you're God's child. You're created in the image after the likeness of God. It is God's good pleasure, Jesus said, to give you the kingdom. Then what's your obligation? To accept. Otherwise, you're resisting your good, which means you're resisting God. God. It is natural for good to happen to us and to keep happening. So, how to get this principle to work for us? I've got a series of steps. Number one, and that's a slide. Take one day a week to acknowledge that you are seeking your good. Do you do that? Probably not. Make a specific day where you remind yourself, I am seeking my good, my, and my good is my God because it draws and pushes me. I am seeking my good, but what's the other half of that? Your good is seeking you. It is trying to express itself through you. It was Eric Butterworth who said we're in the manifest business. In the business of manifesting or expressing, in the express business is the word he used, of expressing God. Well, we're not in that business of expressing God if we're trying to do without, if we think we can't have good in our lives, if we think that we have to suffer or if we believe that we're not good enough. Take a day each week to remind yourself that you are seeking your good and your good is your God. That it does draw you and pushes you to even greater good. Secondly, name a good which is good to you. But what do you think is good in your life? What good would you desire right now? Think about it. What would that be? First name of God is good, and the first name of good is God. What is that to you? Is it peace of mind? Is it greater prosperity? It is, a sen is it a sense of fulfillment? Love, purpose, health. What is that? And then the next step will be to affirm it. That uh, name a good which is good for you. And the, step three is affirm. There is, and then name your good. There is, and then you name whatever that good is and declare it. There is good for me, and I ought to have it. Think about it. Let's together say, 
there is, and silently speak what you think of as good in your life, together, there is, for me, and I ought to have it, together, for me, and I ought to have it. Now let's put the whole thing together. There is, for me, and I ought to have it. Does that seem strange to say? That you ought to have it? Not as God's child. Not as the expression of a creator, which is the source of infinite good and absolute good. And as Jesus says, seeks to give you the kingdom. To give you abundance. So, you take a day a week to acknowledge that you're seeking your good. And then you name a good which is a good to you. And then you affirm that there is this good for you and that you ought to receive it. That you ought to have it. And then the next step. The next slide is realize that when you speak for yourself, you speak for the world. We're all connected, are we not? So Emma Curtis Hopkins suggests that we speak the same word for everyone, when we see, or things. Things. Animals. One source of life, remember? The life in you, the life in your pet, the life in the creatures on this planet. The life, and I'm going to use that word, life, in the materials of the planet itself. You can speak the same word. There is good for you, and you ought to have it. Just imagine what it would be like if you're... Anybody ride a bus these days? <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Toronto buses are kind of nice. Um, Chris rides a bus all the time. I, can't, I think I've been on a bus in Kansas City maybe twice. Do they have buses in Kansas City? I think so. Since this used to be the bus drivers union all, you know. <laughs> but imagine you're riding a bus and you see someone who seems to not have abundance. That seems to be on the edge of life. Can you imagine sitting there thinking of that person and silently saying, there is good for you and you ought to have it. To be a blessing to others. You can do that because you know, hopefully you realize that there's an abundance and everyone having their good does not take away from yours. Or you having your good does not take away from anyone else's. So you speak this same word for others. And then step five, no exceptions, no special cases. Well, you know, there's, there's good for so-and-so, but mm, I'm not so sure about it. Yeah. Or there's good for me, but I don't think it's going to happen. Or I'm too old, or I'm not old enough. All kinds of excuses. No special cases. You don't want anything to slip out from under your blanket realization that there is good for you and that you ought to have it. Once again, you affirm that there is good and it is yours for you to have. And then the sixth step. Realize that you're dealing with an indestructible, and I put in parenthesis, though often unconsciousness, feeling. An indestructible feeling. In other words, the feeling of desiring good and that there is good for you is always there. Realize that it's there. And it's founded on truth, which means it doesn't change. 
the reality of it always is. There is always good for you, and you really ought to have it. So realize the indestructible quality of this presence and this feeling within you and accept it. And when you can accept that it is indestructible and it is your, I'm going to say it, duty, duty to attract good, to affirm your good, to accept your good in this life. Remember, it's not what you can do without, but how much you can accept. How much love can you accept? Mm, well, that sounds like an easy question. Oh, a 55-gallon barrel full. Oh, yeah? I've known plenty of people who could hardly take a thimble full. How much joy? I can hear my mother. At times, I'd be really happy, and she'd say, you'll cry before the night's over. <coughs> Thank you very much, Mom. There you only so much happiness. Sometimes I heard, Billy, you ask for too much. Did God ever tell you that? Never. Never. Charles Fillmore in, in uh, his Talks on Truth, he speaks about you can ask God about anything. You can ask God, he said, for a dress. And then this next one they did rewrite. He said, you can ask God for a drink of whiskey. That there's nothing too wicked to ask God about. You can ask for what you will. Jesus said, ask whatsoever you, don't you love that word? Whatsoever. Say it, whatsoever. Now, does that mean absolutely sky's the limit to you? I hope it does. Whatsoever. Jesus said, you can ask for anything. Jesus never said you ask for too much. God doesn't tell you you ask for too much. Ask whatsoever ye will, because there's good for you, and you ought to have it. Every day, every week, have a day where you acknowledge that you are seeking your good and your good is your God. And know that it draws you, it pushes you to greater and greater good. And then name a form of good, speak it, and then affirm it, that that good is prepared for you. And there's something that one of my teachers used to call the ladder of realization. It's like steps in the process of realizing. I ought to have it. Oh, well, if I ought to have it, therefore, I can have it. If you can say to somebody, you ought to have it, then you can tell them, I can have it. Oh, I can have it. I can, therefore, I can, therefore, I will have it. Ought to, can, I will. I will, therefore, I am it. <clears throat> Process of moving from, gee, I'd sure like to have that, to I ought to have that, I can have that, I will have that, I am that. I am what I seek. So, today. Right now, acknowledge that you are seeking good in your life. Whatever that good is. There's so much more good than just material good, but material good is fine too. God never wrote in the Bible that should you be, have the good fortune of getting a new sofa, you must cover it in plastic because it will be the last one you ever have. Remember those days? Oh, I hope nobody does that anymore, especially in this weather, to sit on that plastic is so unpleasant. Yeah. I can remember times where I've gotten out the cut glass I have and put potato chips in it and used it and put it in the dishwasher and had people just kind of 
opened their mouths in absolute horror that I would dare put antique cut glass in the dishwasher. It's for my use. And folks, when it comes to the dishwasher, trust me, it sparkles. Absolutely sparkles. I went through a period where I decided that I was only going to use fine china for everything. Now let me tell you my definition of fine china. I bought it in the grocery store. And I needed these little wicker trays, thing, round things to put the fine china on. You know what I'm talking about? They're called paper plates. Oh, it's just so easy. But things don't taste as good on a paper plate. Throw a hot dog on a paper plate, eh, throw it on a piece of Lennox, it tastes so much better. My grandmother had some sterling from flatware, and it's what we used for every day. And it was so nice. Whatever you have is to be used, is to enjoy. It's your good. You ought to have it, and you ought to enjoy it. So begin today to acknowledge that you're seeking your good, that your good is seeking you, that your good is your God, and it is pushing you, urging you to a greater experience of who and what you really are. God's beloved child, and who God's already well pleased. I'm going to go back to chapter 17 of Jeremiah. I even put it in the script twice. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his arm, whose heart turns away from the Lord. Don't trust in human perceptions. Don't trust in the stuff that we've been taught all our lives that doesn't work that isn't true. There isn't only so much. And you, it's not true you can only have so much. And don't ask for too much. Connect not to the appearances in the world or the wisdom of the world, but to a knowledge of truth. And that continues with, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord in verse 7 who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. Into that creator that is with you, within you, and seeks to express infinite abundance through you into its world. It's a good passage of scripture. It's a good model of what not to be and what to be. Connected to the source, a darn good alliance, don't you think? <laughs>